Good morning, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, my name is Max Moyo of the Moyo clan of the Rosie Kingdom. We are the original custodians of what you now know as the great Zimbabwe root. I've often said that if the Moyo clan were to come back together again, we would be the largest monarch in Southern Africa. And Zimbabwe would for, be ruined. For, 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 for it is the Moyos that are spread across Zimbabwe, the Lozis in Zambia, Amen. the Barote in Botswana, all used to form part of what was known as the Rosy Kingdom, which had what you now know as the Zimbabwe ruins, as their palace. I am the son of Ham, the son of Noah, the son of Methuselah, the son of Seth, the son of Adam and Eve. I introduce myself this way in all my talks. By the way, I talk for a living. I know some of you have to work. I just wake up in the morning. Where am I talking to today? So I introduce myself this way in all my talks. Firstly, because I'm African. And it is African tradition that you have not earned the right to speak to people until you have formally introduced yourself. Secondly, I introduce myself the way I do because ultimately in life, who you are will determine what you do with your life. Notice I didn't say what school you went to. Who you are determines what you do with your life. Can I go deep on this? Secondly, who you are also determines how much money you will ever make in your life. You didn't get that one, right? So let me repeat that. Who you are determines how much money you will ever make in your life. Notice once again, I didn't say what degree you have. I didn't say what family you were born in. I didn't say what country you come from. I didn't say what color. I said who you are determines how much money you will ever make in your life. And so if you find yourself at the end of the month, unable to pay your bills, you do not have financial problems. You have identity problems. Mm. Mm. Can I say that again? If you are broke, you are broke because you don't know who you are. God is good all the time. All the time. I am convinced beyond measure that there is no other place anywhere near this place that is like this place. So this must be the place. I'm a bit jet lagged because I'll be sleeping now. The timetable is a bit upside down. I arrived yesterday from Jamaica. And um, I, after two weeks in, in, in Jamaica, where I spoke at the Congress of Insurance and Financial Advisors from the Caribbean, 13 Caribbean islands, had the privilege of speaking to those people. Not for free. <laughs> Not for free. But after that, I spent a couple of days. So I was in Montego Bay, and then after that, I drove through to Kingston. Now, here's what I found that has challenged me. Now, I'm a third generation Seventh day Adventist. I own this church. Oh, yes. Some of you might be confused about this, but I'm not confused. I don't have. 
be president of the GC to work this church. Here's what I discovered in Jamaica. They have more Adventist churches per square kilometer in, ja in Jamaica than in any other part of the world. Almost 50% of Jamaicans are Seventh-day Adventists. I had the privilege of preaching at the Andrews Memorial Adventist Church in Kingston, the largest Adventist church in Jamaica. Over 1,200 members. I preached three services there last Sabbath. The president of Jamaica and his wife are Seventh-day Adventists. The former Prime Minister of Jamaica's wife he is a Seventh-day Adventist attends at Andrews Memorial. Probably close to half of the cabinet is Seventh-day Adventist. In South Africa, they don't even know who we are. I was challenged. I was challenged. Christ, before he left, said, Occupy. Till I come. All I see is groups of people hiding till Christ comes. Oh no, no, I do not negotiate. At every stage I get across the world, they know I'm a Seventh Adventist. If you listen carefully to my introduction, I declare up front I'm a child of the Most High God. Get paid for the gospel. The world pays me fifteen thousand US dollars an hour to preach the gospel. So we're going to talk. We're going to talk today. We're going to talk today. We're going to talk today. Because after today, you have no excuse. The work you do is critical to the gospel. Here's the problem. The church doesn't know it. Yes. 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 Say it again. Right? Before you get all excited, you see you are getting excited because you want the church to recognize you. If you want the church to recognize you, you will never rise to the height that God has determined for you because you want the approval of men. Oh, you're not ready for me today. You're not ready for me today. The only approval you need Let's get started. There are 7 billion people in this planet. How many? 7 billion. 7 billion people in this planet. And yet there is not one single individual like you. Think about that. 7 billion people. Not one person like you. Even your own brothers and sisters are not like you. If you are like me, you've looked at your brother and sister, who's child are you? Because the way they behave, the way they think, is totally different from the way you think and behave. If you're a mother or a father, you've got children. Isn't that true of your kids too? Somebody said, you need a manual to raise kids. And I said, well, if you need a manual to raise kids, you're going to need a manual for each child. Because you're a mother, you know you can never treat two children the same. What works for one does not work for the other. Why? Because God, in his brilliance, created us totally different from one another. Even the 
Chinese can copy it. They try. Master copycat the Chinese can do it. Every single one of you, what doesn't matter where you were born, you were born a unique person. One in seven.
in the part of this country where we have the other of the natural wonders of this world. Table Mount. I can get this to work. Table Mount. Now I need you to understand this. There are seven natural wonders in this world. In other words, of these seven, there is nothing like it on planet Earth. As a result of that, people will spend years putting money away for that once in a lifetime trip to Africa to go and see a flat mountain and water going down a gorge. Well, why? Because there is nothing like it on planet Earth. So Temple Mountain is one of seven. Victoria Falls is one of seven. But oh, listen to this one. You are one of seven billion. So statistically, you are more unique and more rare than Temple Mountain of Victoria Falls. People should be walking behind you, going something like this. My, wow. Christ God. 
fed up with it. Came down to earth, to earth himself. Try to tell us who we are. Die on the cross for you to realize, recognize who you are. This is deep stuff. You see, the problem with us is that we've been sold a religion that accept Christ and then go to heaven. Not see. 
ear have not heard. Neither has it entered your mind what it means to be a follower of Christ. One in how many? Seven billion. Seven billion. A unique issue. Now, before you start saying, this guy can motivate us. I personally don't like the concept of motivation. Because motivation is like what they do in church today. They come and motivate you. You get excited and go home and do exactly the same things you've been doing. We have stopped teaching. Because our people require entertainment. Oh, not to be entertained. There's a powerful preacher in town. Everybody goes to that church. We live from one excitement to another. We are not different from the guy who gets drunk every weekend. Yeah. He drinks alcohol every Friday. You what? You seek entertainment at church. And yet your life does not reflect. You see, this meeting was planned long ago. How do I know? See, the good doc and I might think it was because we met. It was the end of January, 27th of January to be precise. Because we met there when I came to address the stewardship. No. I've known Dr. Paul Schoenwer from the days when we were at Solusi. Yet, this year, I finally spoke at the union. I was speaking across the world for the past couple of years. Across churches. Every other church has invited me to their church except the Seventh Adventist Church. Mm. 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 No else have been praying for a long time. Mm. So towards the end of last year, Dr. Chowen calls me and says, Max, next year is the year. Mm. Now watch this. You see, you might think, hey, we're very fortunate. This guy came, this is a Bowen guy, we can't make up with that guy. Came by, then the Demia. You see, before you and I were formed, right. in our mother's world, mm. this meeting was set up. Amen. Now, you need to get this. Why was this meeting first set up? Because you see, me, I was born for this meeting. <laughs> so the past 48 years of my life was preparation for this meeting. You need to get something from this meeting so you can fulfill that which you have been called to do. You see, when you were born, you were born with a unique identity. ID, which stands for irresistible difference. Can I repeat that? Identity. Remember when we talk about identity, what we saw? We call it ID, right? Which stands for irresistible difference. Which means no one can do what you can do. Then besides giving you a unique identity, he gives you a unique set of talents. Why would he do that? Because you were not born by accident. You were born by design for a specific purpose. And because there's a specific purpose, God had to give you specific talents so you can fulfill that purpose. <laughs> so you see now, if you listen carefully, you're gonna pick up this. You were born perfect. Don't need to go to school. Ah, you're not ready for this one. <laughs> for what you were born to do, you don't need to go to school. Yes. Yes. Oh, this is deep. Now, before you all get excited and say, nah, I don't have to study anymore. Uh -huh, that's what I'm talking about. The people perish for lack of what? Uh -huh. But you see, what we call education is Greco-Roman educational system. And I'm beginning
need to discover that the more educated we become, the dumber we become. <laughs> my father, rest his soul, my father, who had three years of education, he used to say, I was the first one to get a degree in my family. Here's what my father would say to my brothers and I. He, you know, we'd make, we'd make stupid mistakes, or rather dumb decisions. Then he'll say, I wasted my money. Yeah. Send him to school. Why? Because he thought by sending us to school, we would become smarter and make much better decisions than he was doing. But he discovered afterwards that education does not make you. Oh, it does. But it doesn't change you. So if you're a crook before you go to school, you're a crook after you come to school. <laughs> So our education just makes you a smarter <laughs> And that goes for our theologians too. Just because someone went and studied theology, it does not change the man. That's why we have crooked pastors. Stay with me, it's going somewhere. I'm just African about this thing, so I'll go about that. Ah. Stay with me. <laughs> Let me give you an example. So my brother spoke this morning. How many of us enjoyed the sermon this morning? I certainly did. And I could tell the brother was holding himself back. And I was sitting there trying to say, just let it go. Let go. Now, that man is gifted. He's a natural. Now let me show you what Dr. Jones is gifted in his own right. So if I try to compete with him in his area of gifting, as brilliant as I am, as gifted as I am, I would only come second best. You know why? Because my problem is not lack of education. My problem is not intelligence. My problem is make up. I cannot beat Dr. Jones at being Dr. Jones. Only Dr. Jones can be Dr. Jones. But watch the fairness of life. You see, I call life the greatest equalizer of them all. We are born different, but we are equalized by life. As brilliant as Dr. Jones is, as gifted as he is, as educated as he is, if he tried to compete with me in my area of natural gifting, he will come second. Amen. So what do you need to do to be number one in the world? Be yourself. There was a song, it's not in the church even now, that was popular in my day. Oh, I'm an alien. I'm an Englishman in New York. And it goes further, it goes further than this. It says, be yourself no matter what they say. You see, I've discovered that in order to be number one in this planet, all I need to do is be myself. Born in Rhodesia. In the heart of racism in Rhodesia. When I say that, you know what people say? Ah, shame. I say, no, it's not a shame. See, most of us are ashamed of our background. I'm not ashamed. Of my background. Between my mother and father, they had three years of education. Spent the first 12 years of my life in the village. I looked at the kettle just like every village boy does. But I am not previously disadvantaged. I know in this country they call people PDIs. 
You South Africans love that. No make some predecessors. Good for you. I'm not predecessors in this advantage. Oh yes, I grew up in, 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 a, in a country where I remember five years old, couldn't walk on the pipe pavement because of my skin. So what? I'm not pretty this it is advantage. I grew up in the village, so what? I'm not pretty this it. We were so poor when I was growing up. Poor people thought we were poor. You know you're poor when poor people say, like <laughs> But I'm not. Previously disadvantaged. You see, when you call yourself previously disadvantaged, what you are saying is that your God, clearly your God and mine must be different. You are saying that your God was too busy in Afghanistan. You see, Afghanistan there was a problem. So your God was too busy in Afghanistan to sort of this thing. And then he Turned around Soweto 1966 and he looks and whoops. Sorry, Janine. You were born black in apartheid South Africa. I'm really sorry I was not looking. But if your God is the same God with my God, then we know that he purposed for you to be born black in South Africa in the heights of apartheid. It's part of God's plan. He told the Jamaicans and the Caribbeans that your God purposed it. That you were born to slay the cats. Yes. It was not an accident. Yes. You see, we gotta start stop tiptoeing around things. You tell me you believe in God. Your child asks you if that what kind of God will make me born black in apartheid? Yeah, but they ask you the question. Tell one group. I said if there was no apartheid, you would have never known. Nelson or Lisha yeah. yeah. If there was no slavery in Egypt, we would have never known Moses. <laughs> so stop looking down at your background. Because when you question your background, you question your creator. How do I know? Because he says, I knew you before you were formed, meaning I determined that you be born in your circumstances. Why? To bring glory to my name. John said, ha, 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 ha. God says, where were you? He just killed 10 of his kids. He says, where were you? Can a creator not do what he wants with his creation? Ha! I love this God. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. Your background is not your disadvantage. Your background is your advantage. White folk pay me to speak about the African village wealth model. Put another way, lessons from heading cattle. You see, each one of us have a role to play in this great unfolding history of mankind. It is your responsibility to find what your role is. Even if you don't want to, you are going to play a role. If you choose God, you play, play a positive role. If you don't choose God, you will become for boot, the architect of a battle. By choice. 
by choice. Are you getting this? Some of you are sitting there and say, Max, I hear what you're talking about, but you don't know what my history is like. Here's what I know. There are no accidents in life. There are no coincidences. Everything happens because it is meant to happen. Let me put it another way. Everything happens because God approves it. Can I repeat that? Everything happens because your God approves it. You were born to be a success. You were born to succeed. You were born perfect. You were born already equipped for the purpose for which you were born. You fail by choice. Can I repeat that? You fail by? You choose. In fact, it's more difficult to fail than to succeed. Oh no, this theology is, is a mess, eh? it's messing up your heads, isn't it? God in his, what did he say? I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Then he goes to and says what? I know what plans I have for you. There are plans to prosper you and not to question, are you prospering? If the answer is no, you are not in the will of God. Christians are lazy. The Adventist of this day is lazy. Let me tell you about my grandfather. Never went to school, not one day. Taught himself how to read and write. Memorized the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Never went to school. My grandfather could preach you into a fit. There are ministers today, pastors today, in the Adventist church in Zimbabwe. Because of my grandfather. Man. Single-handedly, he transformed villages. It's amazing what you can do when Christ is in your life. So stop telling me, oh man, you see, the reason why is because me, I come from a poor home, I'm previously disadvantaged, I didn't go to school, that's why I'm poor, I can't do what he can do, because I don't speak fancy English. Nonsense. <laughs> if my grandfather, without going to school, could memorize an entire Bible, and you went to school, you have no excuse. Oh, slacker! Go to the end. At a man calls a villain D. Lazy. We are lazy in our thinking, we are lazy in our relationship with God, and therefore we are powerless. You went to a sick person and said, Silver or gold if I not. But what I have, I thank you. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. In the journey, oh Lord, if I could just sell this one book so there can be bread on my table. <laughs> we need to stop asking God for money. God does not have money. And let's just settle this. God does not have what? Because they walk on it in heaven. He's already created with everything you need to make all the money you need. And so if you walk in your purpose, you will never want for money. No one has ever lived their purpose and wanted for Between my father and mother, they hardly made 50, 50 rands a week. 
yet they were able to take four boys to school. Of course, my father would go to church for 45 years. So, if you're wondering why I speak like I do, I'm a product of time. <laughs> I'm a product of time. Father of work, I'm a child of work. You cannot tell me. So somebody says, well, Max, you know, as an Indian, Max, I said, well, I understand what you're saying, but Max, you don't know. How do you explain to some woman sitting in some rural village who's poor? I said, you're talking about my mother. She served the purpose. Because today, I speak across the world. I touch lives across the world. What she did, she did in secret. But God knew what he was doing. So don't underestimate the role you play. Not all of us are going to stand up here like I'm doing. A lot of us, our purpose is quiet. I owe a lot to my parents. But a lot, I owe a lot to the same Methodist Church. I owe a lot to missionaries who came from America, from Germany, from South Africa. Because if they had not given of their lives, I would not be here. I was talking to Pastor and Mrs. Cornier the other day. They now live in the States, retired. He was my principal. She was my English teacher. Sabbath school reading at Anderson. Just a fresh boy from the village. I get asked to read the mission reading. I figured out, well, I can read English. I took the road down, went there, and I started reading this story. See, I've already had a, always had a big mouth. Never afraid to stand in front of people. I'm my grandfather's child. And I started reading until I come to this word. Anesthetic. When you're 12 years old, from the village, that's a very strange word. So here was S at Anesthetic, Anesthetic, Anesthetic. After a while, I just jumped the word and carried on. When I finished, Mrs. Kunye calls me aside. She says, I hope you don't stop speaking. Let me give you some advice. Next time, read the article first. Look at the words you don't know. Ask how to pronounce them. So for that, I want you to do the missions reading next summer. The rest is history. So last week, she sees the picture be preaching at the Andrews Memorial, Seven Andrews Church. So she writes, she says, Max, I'm so proud of you. And I say, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am the life that was changed. Every single one of you sitting here has already touched lives. And you can touch more in your own space. Stop looking down on yourself. Our biggest challenge is not what people think of us. Our biggest challenge is what we think of ourselves. I know some of you, duckies. There's some things I get away with because I'm black. But my white brother, sorry man, I have an advantage. Some of you duckies have used apartheid as an excuse. Amen. So it ends today. Amen. My fellow South Africans, stop using apartheid as an excuse for your laziness. Your God, listen to me carefully. Your God caused you to be born in 
Zapata. He did that for a reason and a purpose. Now you go back to him and ask him why. Because when he, when he gives you the answer, there is something you guys can do in this world that the guys in Nigeria who never had apartheid cannot do. See your background, the suffering of your background is necessary for your purpose. So if you never ever discover your purpose, then your pain in life is meaningless. Can I repeat that? You see, the one thing we have in common, rich or poor, black or white, male or female, we have one thing in common. What is that? Pain. We all have had and continue to experience pain. And so, if you don't know and discover your purpose, your pain in life is meaningless. And when your pain is meaningless, you will spend your life questioning God. Where was God when my son died in an accident? Where was God when my daughter was raped? Spoken to African farmers. Where was God when my parents were murdered? Where was God? Your pain, your pain is related. And when you don't live a life of purpose, your pain becomes meaningless. So here's the question. What were you born to do? Because if you can answer, the, if you can answer that question, you have found meaning in life. It is said that two most important dates in a man or a woman's life. The day you were born, which you celebrate every year. Then there's the one day that only 5% of the world's population gets to. Is the day you discover the reason why you were born. Why me? Because if you don't get that, then life is meaningless. It was Solomon who said meaningless. Meaningless. All is meaningless. I said, no, Solomon. You might have been the wisest man. But it's all meaningful. It's all what? When you know purpose. Three things. Identity. Talent. And what? Purpose. I call it the tripartite alliance of success. It's not the ANC Communist Party and Kosatu. It don't work for you. It works for Zuma, not for you. <coughs> Can I go deep on this? <coughs> there it is. You all know the famous African three legged pot. What happens if one of those legs is missing? The story of your life. If any part of your life is not working, I can bet you that the problem is what? It's either an identity problem, it's a talent problem, or a problem. Right, let's make it a bit more practical. Now we've had our share of drama in the church, haven't we? It's not just the ANC only. I remember when Tabo Mbeki was recalled. So I said to his followers, I said, no. You see, this thing with Mbeki is not new. We Christians know about people getting recalled. Do you know who was recalled? Do you remember who was recalled? Pay attention. Moses.
Moses was recalled at the river Jordan. Yeah. God says, sorry for you. Yeah. You're not crossing. Yeah. But we fight for leadership in the church, don't we? Mm. Here's why we fight for leadership. You see, if you don't know who you are, and you don't know what your talents and gifts are, and you don't know your purpose, you are going to look for identity in two things. What are the two things you look for? Position and possession. Those who fight for position don't know their purpose. Amen. Oh, the stuff is not, it's not, it's not easy. We've all been church members for a long time. You know about the church elder who refuses to step down, right? If you've been in the church long enough, we all have a drama of what? The permanent church elder. And so we don't know what to do with him. What do we do? We create another position on the side. Why? You see, the reason why the church elder won't step down is because his identity is in being what? Church elder. When he loses the position, he loses what? His identity. You see, when I know who I am, I don't care about your position. Because all I need to do is do what I was born to do. Those of you from the TOC, mm. Mm. yes, those of you from the TOC, I'm not going to talk about the current drama, I'm going to keep it. There were some pastors who were fired some time ago, you remember that? You remember them? And then they took the church to CCMA. So I went to one of the pastors and I said to the pastor, tell me something, who called you to be a pastor? He said, huh? I said, who called you? He said, uh, what do you mean? I said, uh-uh, it's a clear question. Who called you? <laughs> then I said, if God called you, yeah. you have no business in the CCMA. Yeah. If the seventh day of this church called you, you can take that to the CCMA. Oh, this is deep stuff. You see, if God calls you and they take away the platform, what do you do? You go back to God and say, okay, what do you want me to do now? It's a simple thing. We better be careful about understanding this thing. Because some of us, I don't like leadership positions. You know why? Because we are going to be the answer. And we are going to be answerable for a lot of things. When you become a leader, it means. But we're going, to talk, we're, going to, we're going to talk about leadership later on. But I want, I want you to understand context. But let, let, let me make it practical. So you can see, Max, you're, you're theorizing. Because I'm sitting here, Max, in theory, it makes sense. But you see, Max, you're not in my shoes. So let me be practical. Have you ever heard of a man called Albert Einstein? Yes. Everybody seems to know a man called Albert Einstein. What do you know about him? Yes. He is considered to be the smartest man that has ever lived, isn't it? He's considered to be the most intelligent person that has ever lived. Do you remember that? So for those of you who didn't do physics, Einstein brought us the theory of relativity E is equals to mc squared. Let me explain in Lenin's terms. We have nuclear power today because of Albert Einstein. So I was in America and I was addressing a group of multi-millionaires at the Million Dollar Round Table. So I said to them, the only reason why Einstein is considered to be the most intelligent person that has ever lived is because I wasn't born. <laughs> What can I say? My South African brothers would have said that, no, Max, you need them a baptize in India. So everybody laughs, except whenever I go, I said, I said the same thing in India, they all laughed. Let me explain it. You see, as brilliant as Einstein was, and he was brilliant, you can't take that away. If he tried to do what I do, he 
you will become second best. In the same way that if I try to do what Einstein did, I'd come out. But you see, your system, the world system that you operate in, says that if you're not good in math and science, you're what? You are dumb. I like the Afrikaans word. Dumb is even better. <laughs> it seems to me, if it's going to be dumb. So we said if you're not good in, Africa, in, 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 in mathematics or science, you're what? You're dumb. Well, I've got news for you. They lied. It's one of the greatest lies brought to you by the Greeks because the Greeks brought competition to the world. You see, Jewish thinking, what I call Hebraic thinking. You see, the Greeks celebrated the beauty of the body. They built the Olympic Stadium, the gymnasiums you go to, they're all built by the Greeks so they can compare that mine is bigger than yours. <laughs> While the Hebrews celebrated the beauty of holiness. Yeah. See, you, if you forget that there's a major difference between the kingdom you belong in and the kingdom you live in, if you start living by their standards, they're going to beat you. Somebody once said, never argue with a fool. Yeah. He will pull you down to his level and then he will beat you with experience. <laughs> and that's what the world is doing with you Christians. They pull you into their system, then they tell you that you are dumb. Because if you are dumb, that means God made a mistake. There was a defective product. But I read in Genesis and God says, He looked and it was good. Yes. And He looked and it was good. And He looked and it was good. So when did you then become dumb? Yes. Now look at your parents. You have conspired with the teachers and told your kids they're dumb. Boys, haven't you said this to a child? Particularly mothers. Don't worry, don't worry, sweetheart. It's not your fault. You take after your, 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 your father's family. <laughs> Just look at your uncles. I know you are saying it out of trying to what? To make your child feel better. But the truth of the matter is if you are a Christian mother or father, a teacher tells your child they are dumb. You better take them to task. You are created. You can't tell your child you're creating the image of God and at the same time tell them they're done. Because then the image of God that they have is what? Listen to what Einstein says. He says, I am not the smartest person that has ever lived. I am not the most intelligent person that has ever lived. Why Einstein? Because if you measure a fish by his ability to climb trees, he will spend the rest of his life thinking that he is dumb. Can I repeat that? If you measure a fish by his ability to climb trees, he will spend the rest of his life thinking he is dumb. In other words, fish were built to swim. If you measure them by how well they climb trees, they are dumb. The story of your life. Every time somebody said, well, you were dumb, it was because you were being measured for what you were not born to do. You see, I've discovered that brilliance, brilliance has nothing to do with math or science. Intelligence has nothing to do with mental science. Intelligence is a man or a woman who has walked into that which he or she was born to do. Find what you were created to do and instantly you walk into your brilliance.
Jeremiah says, no, that I'm just a child. What does God say? Don't say that. Because I knew you. I created you to be a prophet to the nations. Some of you are sitting here, created to be a prophet to the nations. You think being prophet and LNG what? Can I go to you? If you go read the book of Samuel, first Samuel, one, two, three, it says that the word of God was scarce. It was rare. Why? Was God not speaking? There was just no subject. There was no one who was abandoned to God so God can use him. God used LNG White because she was abandoned. Favorite songs. I gave myself up so you can use me. We are too concerned about I, 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 me, me, me. Have you seen our prayers? God can listen. Because what we call prayer is what? Is giving God counsel. Yes, I will go prayer. We're giving God what? God, this is what I think the problem is. And this is what I think you should do about it. I fasted too, so you must better do something about it. Now watch this. So Einstein was brilliant because he discovered what he was born to do. Be fruitful. Multiply. Have dominion. Dominion over what? Everything. So Einstein wasn't smart. He was just a man who was doing whatever it was that he was born to do. So the question for you is what were you born to do? Find that and you'll walk into your brilliance. Amen. So in your business, for instance, did you know there are some people who will do business with you but will not do business with me? And they can't explain why they will not buy from me, but they won't buy from me. But you walk in there and they'll buy from you. You already have your customers. All you have to do is what? Find them. But the problem is that if you are not clear about your identity, you know how you walk? Yeah. I am from the home health education service. <laughs> Yes, I did. I did a couple of months of the work you guys do when I was 17. I am from where? Home Health Education Service. <laughs> so the wife goes back and says, who was there? She says, some desperate woman. <laughs> because when you are desperate, I can smell it. Do you know why people pay me to stop talk to them? Have you noticed that I'm very direct? Have you not? I speak with authority. I believe what I'm talking about. I'm not. I, I, I'm not trying to. This is take it or leave it. But if you pay me, I'm going to tell you what I think, or rather, I just let God tell you what He thinks. You cannot go in this world behaving like you are subhuman. Yes. Behaving like a second class citizen. You have something that the world needs. But because of you, the world can't get it. So if you are not willing to stand up and be counted, quit. Oh, you didn't hear it. You would rather quit than misrepresent God. Give up if you're not prepared to do what it is. Because you mess up. Because a person who could have bought now has not bought. And then they'll only buy 10 years from now and their kids are already messed up. Because you didn't do the job that you're supposed to do. So when you get out of here, I hope you call a seven day fast. 
and begin to deal with yourself first. Yeah. You have absolutely no business getting out here and going to represent a God you don't know. Yeah. I'm not yet there. Let me finish this one. Practically. Now watch this. Einstein says, when he talks about the theory, what he's celebrated for, which is the theory of relativity. He says, I dreamt as if I was sitting on a ray of light. And then it came to me. I was 45 years old when I read that. Let me quit my job. I said, what? I dreamt as if I was sitting on a ray of light. And then it came to me. Then I remembered from my science class that when he came up with that equation, they did not even know how it functioned. I said, you, I said, you mean you were celebrated for a dream? But then I remembered that I'm not previously disadvantaged. So when you don't understand stuff, you go back to where you come from. Isn't it your Bible that said that? You go back to the stone from which you were formed. So I went back to the stone from which I was born. And I remember as a little boy growing up in the village, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd dream and I'd rush to my grandmother. And I'd say, Coco, I had a dream. My grandmother would pick me up, sit me on her lap, and then she'd tell me the dream. I'd tell my grandmother the dream. And then in typical African grandmother fashion, she would proceed to interpret the dream. That was the best part of dreaming as a little boy is your grandmother telling you what it means. And that was beautiful until I went to school. When I got to school, the educated folk told me, hey, you see you villagers, <coughs> dreams are a figment of your imagination. So next time I had a dream, I told my grandmother, my grandmother said, ah, Wait a minute. There's a problem here. You see, you're not educated. Dreams are a figment of the imagination. And the interpretation of my dreams. 45 years old. Einstein. One of the most intelligent people that ever lived had a dream that changed the world as we know it. Then I remember. And here's what I discovered. My grandparents, your grand, all of you, your forefathers were not educated, remember? You all came from some rock in the sometime. They understood something that we who are educated don't understand. They understood that we are not human beings who have an occasional spiritual experience every Sabbath. Get ready for this. Are you ready? We are spirit beings having a human experience. Can I repeat that? You are a spirit being having a human experience. Max Kuhn. They say God cannot be known unless those who worship him worship him what? How can you worship in the spirit if you're not a spirit? <laughs> now let me explain this before you start saying that's this kind of new theology. Now you all had mothers at one time in your lives, right? Do you remember when you were, when you were a child and you, you, you know you and your children we pick friends everywhere we go, right? So you picked up a friend and you brought them home. Some boy. You just, you know, you're playing with kids. Then you played at your house, you played at the house, and then when that boy left, your mother calls you and says something like this. I don't want to see you play with that boy ever again. In fact, if I do, I will beat the black <laughs> You remember a conversation like that? <laughs> Was your mother right? Yes. Was that boy up to nonsense? Yes. Question, how did your mother know? I mean, all you women know, you, you know you got this thing. Just a knowing. So the world calls it what? Gut feel. 
And because you're not connected to your world, to your world where you come from, you also call it what? <laughs> it's your spirit. You see, your mind only knows that which it has experienced. Your spirit, however, knows things that your mind has not experienced. If you're a husband, you know what I'm talking about. Because you've heard this conversation with the wife, she says, don't ask me how I know, I just know. Yes. <laughs> and boy, are they always right. Why? It's because women generally are more connected to their spirits than men. So when Christ said, you needed to be born again, he wasn't talking about your body. He was talking about your Spirit. Because when you get born again, it's your spirit. In other words, when Adam sinned, our spirit went to sleep. And when you get born again, that part of you called the spirit comes alive. And as you begin to dwell in the presence of God, your spirit grows until you get to the point where sales are Spend time with God and you will not have a problem with sales. Amen. How do I know? And Enoch walked with God. And Enoch was? Popcorn? Christ will look at someone and you will know what you are thinking. How do you know? He just reads your spirit. Some of you are sitting here saying, this guy speaks as if he knows what I'm going through. Yes, I do. Not up here, where? My spirit knows. So my spirit is speaking to you. That's why I don't stick to a script. If I do a PowerPoint presentation, I'm telling you what I think. When I speak without the PowerPoint presentation, I allow the spirit to speak to your spirit. You get the picture? That's why when I preach, I don't preach with the script. I rock up like I did now I go there and I say, okay, except download. God knows exactly what you need to hear. He's got a message for you. All I need to do is spend time with God. You will do the rest. Are you getting this? So don't come and brag to me about your PhD. As an investor, Johannes is talking to guys, and so they talk about how they put their PhD, MBAs, all that fancy stuff. I said, well, nice and good. I said, I don't have an MBA. But I know some stuff that they don't teach at Harvard. I have access to the source of what? Amen. Because I get this. So Einstein was not smart, he just walked into what he was born to do. You too need to walk into what you were born to do. Amen. And the world will celebrate you because there is nothing like you on planet Earth. Mm. Mm. Second, second example, and then I'm going to move on. The second example is the Wright brothers. Have you ever heard of the Wright brothers? Yes, fine. They brought us what? Aeroplane. 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 Did you know that the, the Wright brothers were, were bicycle mechanics? Mm. Yes. They fixed bicycles for a living. Now, the bicycles of today are complex. The chain comes up, you're going to have some problems. In my day, a bicycle was simple. You put the chain on, you pull the vent tire as far back as you can, and you tie, and you jump on. You did not need a brain to fix the bicycle. So here's what I imagine the Red Brothers were doing. As young brothers, you know, they go to a party and they get there. Ladies, some of you would have to think back in your day when you were still happening. And you were at a gathering. And there he walks in, tall, dark. Yes, See, I tell people I like the dark part because it includes me all the time. <laughs> and he says, hi. And your knees kind of give up a little bit. You say, hi. <laughs> and you're excited because 
because he looks like the guy you've been praying for. You're already seeing your children in his eyes. <laughs> but you see, like all meetings, we get to that point where we ask that question that we all don't like. What's the question we don't like when we meet people, new people? What is the question we don't like? What do you do? And then he says, I fix bicycles. <laughs> to which you say what? Nice meeting you. <laughs> because we measure people according to what they do instead of measuring them out of what? You see, I'm more than what I do. Yes, I'm a speaker. I'm a father. I'm an uncle. I'm a husband. I'm, I'm a son. Are you getting this? But if you measure me according to what I do, you miss the rest of me. So because they fixed bicycles, I figured out they couldn't get a date. So one day when they walked out of their workshop, the one brother says to the other, hey, but I'm tired of fixing bicycles. Why don't we put together a flying machine? Now you've got to understand this. This is the 1800s. No one has ever flown before. They've never seen an aeroplane. You can't even do what now we go on Google when you say I'm going to Google something. You can't go on Google. To make matters worse, this is very interesting. To make matters worse, the educated guys had met in the United Kingdom, because those days the United Kingdom was the center of education. The world scientists and engineers have met. They've just released a paper that says it is scientifically impossible for metal to fly. Across the Atlantic, in the United States of America, two uneducated boys are putting together the best government. And I've often said this, thank God the right brothers are not educated. Because had they been educated, they would have, the conversation would concern in this. Hey, put, let's put together an aeroplane. And I guess, uh, sorry, man, Andrew, it's impossible. What do you mean it's impossible? Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 6, page 13. <laughs> if those days we used to, yeah, you remember we used to use those days up there. And then that would have been the end of the conversation. And I would still be on a boat, not coming back from Jamaica, but still going to Jamaica. <laughs> and yet it took me 18 hours from Kingston to Johannesburg. Now most of you will think the Wright brothers discovered plan flying. I mean, you know, they were smart, aren't they, in America? No. They put together the first aeroplane because that's what they were born to do. Oh, you're not ready for this. It was not intelligence. It was not education. It was what they were born to do. You see, God could have created us with aeroplanes already. But he wants us to be creators like he is. So he led us out into the world and say what? Be fruitful. Multiply. Dominate. Improve this world that I've created. And then he put ideas in each one of you. The problem is that if you don't discover who you are, you cannot manifest the purpose that you are. Are you getting this? Because I want you to get out of your mind to think that the, the person who made an airplane was a, a smart scientist. No, it was two brothers. When the educated community was saying it, what? Just like you guys sell books that speak stuff that maybe the educated community does not think is true. And sometimes they think some of the theories are what? Are crazy. Are you getting this? I want you to remember the right brothers the next time you meet a client who's got some issues. 
Are you getting this? So the question is, if Einstein was born for nuclear energy, the Wright brothers bring us flying, uh, Chris Barnard opened heart surgery, what were you born for? Nelson Mandela! Oh, you guys. You see, the ANC thinks they created Nelson Mandela. <laughs> yeah, they think they own it. But anyone in this right mind will know that Nelson Mandela was larger than the African National Congress. How do I know? If the Nash African National Congress does to you what apartheid did to you, you must do to the Nash African National Congress what we did to. That was Nelson Mandela. You see, Nelson Kolesha Mandela was born specifically for that purpose. Yes. Born a kunu where nothing happens, even trees don't like growing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. He could have been born wealthy. Instead, he went to Fort Hare. I wouldn't go there if you paid me. Because they've run it down. But God in his wisdom, what does he do? You see, God doesn't use the world's wisdom because if he did that, he sends him to prison. 27 years. Amen. To prove a point that you can go to Harvard, you can go to Princeton, you can go to Yale, but you could never be as great as a man I trained in prison. Nelson Mandela is in prison, he discovered something. I'm not in jail because a white man put me in here. I'm in jail because it is my destiny. And the moment he discovers that, he embraces his destiny. So he could walk up and say, I forgive you all. Mm. And the other guy said, Comrade, you lost your mind. <laughs> because others were in jail for their reasons. He was in jail because it is destiny. Why are you a rich evangelist? Oh. Yes. Oh. Yeah. 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 If I was talking to pastors now, I'd be asking yeah. the same question Why are you a pastor? Yeah. Why are you a teacher? Why are you a husband? Why are you a wife? Is it because it's your destiny? Or because this is the only job you can do? Look for a job everywhere. No one will employ you. But the master master will do so. You became a little evangelist. <laughs> and now you do the minimum required so that the enemies don't fire you too. <laughs> no, the good Lord did not pay me to say that. But I bet you that I didn't plan to say that either. But my spirit knows someone needs to give. Now let me prove this point. Because some of you sitting here, I know what people, you know what they did to us. So let me let me set the record straight. What people didn't do, Jeff, to you. It's what you do to yourself. Oh. Nelson Mandela was in jail, and we say it was because a white person put him there, right? Across the, the, the ocean, in the United Kingdom, white people woke up every morning to go to the South African embassy to do what? You think you guys can toy toy? The Brits could toy toy. They toy toyed in front of that embassy for 27 years. Yeah. They built the name Nelson Mandela. Yeah. God tried to prove to you that you didn't build it. Yeah. He did it to himself. Yeah. So Nelson Mandela becomes the greatest statesman the world has ever known. Oh, yeah. Like Joseph yeah. from prison to Paris. So great that at one time he was the second most recognized brand outside of Coca Cola. Anywhere in the world, sell Nelson Mandela. Ah. <laughs> I was in China in 2009. I said, Where are you from? I said, South Africa. I said, Huh? I said, South Africa. Huh? I said, Nelson Mandela. Ah. <laughs> that if you leave your purpose, you'll never want for money. Didn't I say that? Yeah. Let me prove it to you. Nelson Mandela works for how long? 
Five years. He made less than a million rands a year in that five years and retired. Yeah. As far as I know, there was no corruption. Yeah. You can look at his house in Kulu. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the one in Hatem was, was bought by the Jews, so he didn't pay. Yeah. Yet when he died, yeah. he was 46 million rands rich. Some of you sitting here are broke. You were working for 15, 20 years while Mandela was in prison. <laughs> We like crutches. No, it's because of this. It's because of that. It's never because of me. It's always somebody else's problem. And if I can find anybody to blame, then I blame God for creating me black. When he died, 90 heads of states came to Africa. In the history of the planet, it has never happened. One man from Ekum struggled to get his law degree. He wasn't that smart. Yet when he walked into his purpose, he becomes the greatest statesman, any man. So the world tells us that black people are second class citizens. There's a conspiracy. Just like there was a conspiracy to destroy the Jews. There was a conspiracy for many years. Most of us grew up in that environment which told us that we're second class citizens. And because we look at our circumstances, we think this must be true. I mean, we make the president, they spent 230 million rand building their village. The other one, he became president, he becomes president for life. <laughs> I mean, isn't that living proof? <laughs> Are you getting, so, so when you look at the evidence, the evidence seems to point at the fact that there's something wrong with the black man. <laughs> yes. Can I speak French? I always do whether even if you don't like it, it's too late. Now watch this. You see, I love God. You know why I love God? Because God has always been in charge from the beginning to where we are. Hallelujah. Even to the end. Not once has God lost control of the earth. Not once. The devil does not do anything without permission from God. Oh, no, no. You don't understand. You want me to prove it? So the children of Israel must go to Egypt. Why do they go to Egypt? Who decides whether it rains or not? So God purposed for them to go to, to Egypt, isn't it? Yes. In fact, he told Abraham before those guys were born and said, your children will go to Egypt for 400 years. Yes. So was it part of God's plan? Yes. Yes. Because before that, the Jews were a bunch of shepherds. You see, if you're a herdman looking at the cattle, it's a bit smart. If you look at the sheep, it's a bit of a problem. Why? Because sheep are dumb. You see, sheep will wait like this while the lion is eating the other one. Yeah. <laughs> Waiting for? So can you imagine after 40 years of looking after these dumb creatures, what happens to you? Your IQ drops too. But God wants to 
do some stuff with these guys. So what does he do? What was the center of education at that time? Uh -huh. It was Egypt. So God sends them to Egypt because they need to, they need to learn. Yes. But God has another plan. The Egyptians need to know about who? God. The problem was, you see, when Joseph went there, the Egyptians got to know God. Yes. When the rest of them got there, what happened? They forgot about God. And they adopted just like you and I. God has never lost control. Don't, don't ever think for a moment that God doesn't have this world under control. He knows exactly what he's doing. So he's, here's what happened. So the world begins to, I think people even start like writing books about how black folk are a bit of that. And I love it, and I love when people do that because God likes to prove it all. So what does God do? Around the 60s, God decides I'm going to restore my own creation. So you see Martin Luther King, the Mandela's, they're all, you know, then, rhythm and blues, jazz, Michael Jackson, boxing, Pele. What is God doing? In the height of all the slavery and whatever, God keeps proving that they are my creation. Create my own image in my own likeness. The devil says, no, they are not. By the 90s, the Williams sisters takes all, take over tennis. Predominantly white sport. Tiger Woods takes over golf. By 2008, the crowning glory, God has fully restored the black man to his rightful place. Barack Hussein Obama becomes the first not African. To run the United States of America. They said it was more than a hundred years away. Those of you who are students of scripture, if you're watching the events that led to Obama getting elected, you see the hand of God. October, McCain is leading. Barack has no chance. So what does God do? He collapses. Analyze. What happened? America overnight elects a black man as president of the United States of America. I remember at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was sitting at home watching the election because I follow the United States politics because I understand. If you read Sister White, you understand the key is in the United States. So I always follow their politics. <laughs> 3 o'clock when I, it was obvious, Barack Obama called my brother. I said to him, Do you realize what today means? means that you and I can now tell our children that you can be anything yes. that you want to be. Yes. Amen. God had completed the restorative work of restoring black people in the right place. Now watch what's happening now. Who is now leading the spreading of the gospel across the world? I'm just helping you because some of you have issues. Some of you don't even understand. Let me, let me take you through black in the Bible. I love this. I'm not political, but I want you to understand this. Egypt is where? I just, I'm just, it's where? Ah. So when God wanted to teach his people some things, what did they send them to? Where was the knowledge? Ah, no, 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 I just went. They went to Egypt, they forgot about God. Yeah. Who did God use to teach Moses about God? See, you don't know your Bible. Jethro, who was Jethro? A priest of what? Of the Most High God, go read your Bible. What color was Jethro? 
Let's move on. When they were in the desert and they needed direction, what did they use? Oh, I know you know about fire and shout. Do you remember Moses asking Jethro for somebody to go with them in the desert? Because what? Because they know the way. So if you go read your Bible throughout the Bible, you begin to see that God has always used his creation. So stop feeling sorry for yourself. Amen. The reason why you believe what apartheid taught you is because you don't read the Bible that's in your house. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you like it is. Stop looking at other things and it's your fault. No, it's your fault. You don't read, you become ignorant. And when you are ignorant, when you don't know who you are, someone else will tell you who you are. And when someone else tells you who you are, they are always wrong. You want to know who you are? Get into that Bible. I don't care whether you are black, yellow, white. I don't, if you want to know who you are, you want to know what your inheritance is, you better get it back into that Bible. I mean, if you are getting some benefit out of this. I'm saying this because I recognize that some of you are sitting here with some serious issues around the identity. For generations, you pretend like you, no, 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 but you will tell your kids, well, I mean, you know, what good can come out of a black person? This is not a white man saying this. It's you saying it to your children. So even your kids don't believe they're going to be much. And you call yourself a Christian. When you say what God doesn't say about you, you are the devil and the same shoes. <laughs> I, need to, I need to understand. When you speak, how many of you are dead here? Okay, you don't lift your hand. <laughs> okay, you don't have to lift your hand. Did you know that death is ungodly? <laughs> death. Am I child? Is called You want me to prove it? It's in the Bible. He says you are going to be the head and not the tail. You will what? Land and not. So if you are borrowing, you are out of the will of God for your life. What I'm talking about is practical Christianity. You see, you've got a head full of verses. It's not practical. So when I get on my knees, I say, Lord, I cannot borrow. <laughs> you said I will lend and not borrow. If I lend, I bring your name into disrepute. Because the heathens will quote your Bible and say, you said I will lend and not borrow. Now I'm borrowing. And when you're borrowing, you're borrowing from the heathen anyway. And God turns around and says, you borrow because you don't know who you are. I created you already a unique person with a unique set of talents. If you could engage your talents and then live your purpose, you will not want your money for money. You are broke because you don't know who you are. I have come that they might have life and have it much more abundantly. How are you going to have an abundant life when you don't know the God you worship? I want to round off because in the afternoon we'll talk a little bit about money. I want to round off because I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit much to take. But I've only got this time. I might never ever get another chance to speak to you again. So, I want to recap a little bit something I learned from Jewish rabbis. So you were born a unique entity with a unique set of talents and gifts that give you access to a unique purpose. No one else in the world can fulfill your purpose. Are you getting the picture? Yes. 
So the world is poorer because you refuse to do what you were born to do. Let me give you a better example. The cure for HIV AIDS already exists. Uh -uh. You don't understand where I'm going with this. It's sitting in someone's head. It could be someone sitting here. It could be somewhere at the pub. It could be that guy who works in your garden. It could be the guy who's cooking your food. It could be the guy who washes your car. They don't know what they were going to do. So all they do is now, I was born poor, you know, Max. Uh, my parents never had money for me to go to school. And so you know, we learn like to justify our lack of progress. Yet, the greatest part of the gospel is its ability to read why your brain and tell you who you are and move you into your purpose. We cannot have a gospel that is trying to get us to escape from it. The gospel of Christ transforms the world. to all the world and only then shall the end come so who's who's delaying christ we are so we say no they, you know it was you know you know some of us who grew up in the church we have christian jokes see i didn't just grow up in the church i went to church schools only yes i'm a true Adventist. now we'll kill the schools but you know it's, it's another story one thing that I hope to live to restore proper Adventist education. Yes. At one time we were transforming the world. We were on fire. Now we are like whips. You know what we went wrong? We started to want to be like them. And the day we try to be like them, you can't beat them like being them. When I was growing up, heathen parents used to come to school crying to get their children to school because they saw that if you went to an Adventist school, you got transformed. Amen. Now, Adventist parents don't send their school children to school. We have lost faith in our own. There's work to be done. You see, I speak to you because I'm speaking to my own people. In another ways, I'm speaking to myself. So if you feel judged, that's not the idea. It's a wake-up call. Because I believe we are now sitting at the Kairos moment. God is raising a new army because the time has come. We can no longer sit. The role that you play as evangelist, Amen. you guys think you're selling books? No. It's as good as, I don't tell people I'm a speaker, I say I'm a preacher. I just get paid to preach. Businesses pay me to preach them. I just don't shove Christ down their throats. But when I'm done with them, they're going to go for any church. <laughs> So let's go. So, so I want you to understand this process. You come to God. God reveals to you what your identity is. Then he also shows you what is already planted inside of you. Then he gives you a mission. Identity, talent, purpose. Again, the picture. If you do that, God guarantees We all know what we want to do. How do I know? Peter. What was he doing? He thought he was going to fish. And Christ says, yes, you are right. You got, you got the part right. But now, let me show you what I created you for. So from the physical, Peter moves into the... The man speaks. 3,000 give their lives to Christ. Yeah. Imagine that a single one of you would speak and 3,000 give their lives to Christ. Mm. We would be in heaven already. Mm. 
So you have a question, and your question is, Max, I hear you, where do I start? Right? Where do I start? You start in the Bible. How many of you have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Let me see it. Impressive, you know, of all the churches I've visited, this is the largest group of people that have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I'm talking pastors included. Let me find out. How many of you have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation more than once? Ah, the numbers become less. How many read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation every year? One person. You really want to take over the world? You know what the secret is? Read the Bible. Notice that you study the Bible. I said what? Like a novel. Let me explain this. Let's suppose I decide that I love the sister city here. Right? So I tell her in your hearing that hey, sisters, your eyes, they make me feel somehow. Right? And this is the last time that I speak to her. After this, I will start spending time with her mother, with her father, with her brothers and sisters, with her best friends. After two years, how much of her do I know? That's the relationship you have with God. You see, what you have is second-hand knowledge of God. It's based on, you listen to sermons. Even when you read, you don't read the Bible, what do you read? Other people's ideas of what God is. So we read church books, we read Ellen G. White, we read all the stuff except. Who wrote the Bible? God. So how are you going to know God when you are reading everything else that's surrounding God except Him? That is the reason why the church has lost power. Because we don't know God. We know about God. That's why we go to church and we listen, we cry, we... And then you go home and you beat your wife. Oh, now you want me to pretend like you're not beating your wives. <laughs> you cannot transform until you allow the word of God to transform. Are you ready for this? How many of you are ready for change? Keep your hands up because I want to see who's not ready. How many of you are ready for change? Keep your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, let these walls be witnesses. Let the angels who are this, in this room be witnesses. That your people are making a commitment to get to know you better. And Father, when they do so, I pray that your spirit will rain upon them. That they'll be able to call fire from heaven in the work that they do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's the process. Starting tonight, yes. you will read, you start in Genesis, 15 chapters of the Bible. Not verses. Can I repeat it? Yes. 15 chapters of the Bible every single day for the rest of your life. Now, if you are a fast reader like me, that's an hour of reading. If you are slow, you are looking at about an hour and a half to two hours of reading. 
No, don't look me at like that, like that. How many hours are you spending in generations? You see, the average person is prepared to spend six hours in front of TV. You can't spend two hours with God. Now listen to me carefully, because this is very important. Because I sound like I'm telling a story, but watch this. The only way you can fellowship with the Father is when you read the Bible. When you go to church, you are not fellowshipping with God, you are fellowshipping with men. That time, the anointing only comes on you in your time of study. Go read the beginning of this church. And you're going to note they were consistently do not in the Bible. Now, you cannot continue to do the same things and expect a what? A different result. I am not asking you to do what I'm not doing. Between my wife and I, I do 10 ch 15 chapters every day, my wife does 15. That's what, I do, I do 15, she does 10. Now, let's become Christians. Evil has taken over our country. <coughs> Evil has taken over South Africa. You know that, right? Yes. Whose fault is it? Who's going to push evil back? Get off your knees. Start saturating yourself in scripture. One man abandoned to God can transform Africa. Because 12 men abandoned to God transform the world. Are you with me? So now, what I'm talking about now is that you're now going to go to your homes and build an altar of prayer. Abraham gets called. He goes out from his land, arrives in Canaan. What's the first thing he does? He builds an altar. What is an altar? It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of because when you build an altar, you create an open heaven. Yes. It's a spiritual, so effectively, wherever there's an altar of God, which spirit is in charge? Where there's an altar of the devil, which spirit is in charge? How do we know that the devil is in charge in South Africa? Not long ago, you sat here quietly while the government of South Africa signed same-sex marriage yeah. as a law. You and I sit quietly. If God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, then God must judge South Africa. If he doesn't judge South Africa, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how else to put it. This is serious. You can no longer take your Christianity lightly. We are answerable. Now here's what we do. Book of Psalms. Elkanah was married to Penana and what? Anna. Anna could not have kids because God has closed, has closed her womb. Every day she cried, and 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 Anna used to really, you know. What does Anna do? She builds an altar. She builds an altar, and if the altar comes alive, she's pregnant with child. She says, "I will abandon the child." Now, if you read the first, those three, first just those three, three, three chapters, you discover that the evil had taken over Israel. It says that the sons of Eli, Phineas and, uh, what's the other guy? Of me and Phineas, what they did? They slept with the women at the temple. Just that like we are doing these days. Yes! What happens when believers begin to sin so openly? 
And the word of God becomes rare. So when the word of God is rare, what do we preach? We preach our own mind. Our own degrees. Our own theology. What we read in books. That's not the word of God. So how did things change? You see, God cannot move until somebody abandons themselves to God. For Israel, it was the little boy Samuel. If you start reading from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you see, consistently the Bible says, and the boy Samuel witnessed to God. And the boy Samuel continued to what? What was he doing? He was there. Now, note what's interesting. Phineas and have whatever he's done. Not that you have. But anyway, Phineas and this guy were brought up in the same temple. Where Samuel was being brought up by the same father. Look at how different they turned out. What was the difference? Same word of God. A heart not abandoned. And a heart abandoned to God. The word of God is powerless until you allow God to go out. When I say abandoned, in other words, you want nothing except Christ. That's it. So I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away so you can use me. Abandoned to God. So little Samuel is abandoned to God. He lives only in God. And then what happened? <coughs> One day, the word of God came. Samuel, Samuel is running around. Because he's never heard the voice of God. Have you heard the voice of God? How are you going to hear the voice of God you don't spend enough time with God? You've got to be ministering in the presence of God long enough. And it takes you 10 years before God speaks and you stay there until he speaks. And God spoke. And Israel was transformed. One boy abandoned Day in, day out, day out, Samuel did not play with the other kids. Abandoned God. You see, I ask you to read 15 chapters and you're thinking, this guy's not serious. I mean, I've got a life. If you still have a life, you are not abandoned. A literature evangelist who goes out who does not read the Bible is a powerless Christian evangelist. Here's what should happen when you get into the house. The sick must be healed. The blind eyes must open. The cripple must walk. Because when you do that, you stop trying to chase people. But because you don't spend time with God, you lack the anointing and you are trying to be a salesman just like a guy who is selling insurance. And so you are powerless. You are supposed to be the most powerful salespeople in the world. The insurance guys should be coming to you and say, how do you do it? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. How many chapters? Mm -hmm. <coughs> 15 chapters a day. I'm on my second reading. It's the second quarter. I'm in the book of, as you can tell, Psalm. Every 90 days, I go through that Bible. And I've discovered one thing. The moment I started doing that, I have become a powerful voice across the globe. 
Guys who have been speaking in South Africa for a long time, they've written 15 books. I haven't written one. I've got one that's coming up next month. They ask me, how do you do it, Max? What do you think I said? 15 chapters. <laughs> No, no, because that's my witness. People come after my talks, they come to me and say, Max, what is the best book to read if I want to be transformed? What's the best motivational book, what do you say? I read almost every motivational book I could get. When I finish, I realize that I've been wasting my time. Everything I need to know about life already exists in that one. Yes. I was speaking in, in, in Chicago. One woman follows me afterwards, she says to me, Mr. Moyo, who is your guru? <laughs> no, no, who's your guru? She says, her guru is from India. I said, my guru is Jesus. <laughs> you know what he said that a lot of people do? They get taken aback because they don't expect you to. Because in the business, I'm, really I'm talking to believers. I'm talking about where I am talking to non-believers. You know, I have preached in a Hindu temple. Continue to preach a gospel that we don't know. 